So, uh, yes, thanks for the introduction. My name's David Hardcastle. I run uh, a team in Amazon Cambridge called the Alexa Knowledge Team. My team's responsible for combining artificial intelligence, natural language processing, and a knowledge base to answer questions uh, that uh, our customers pose to Alexa. Uh, Cambridge is uh, it's quite a broad campus. I also act as the, the site leader there. That's a sort of facilitating a, a role that uh, I coordinate activity with some of the other leaders of other organisations uh, in Cambridge. So that includes uh, Prime Air, uh, and uh, Lauren's here from Prime Air, the director of Prime Air in Cambridge. So delivering uh, to customers in less than half an hour by drone. Uh, we also have uh, Core Machine Learning. Uh, that's a team whose, uh, whose mission is to, is to transfer uh, the smart things that are going on using machine learning in one area of Amazon's business, to figure out how to transfer the techniques, the knowledge, the, the tools into other areas of the business so we can get benefit from those. Uh, another large team in Cambridge is Lab126. Uh, they're part of a global team with responsibility for innovation in hardware. So one thing that really connects the different groups in Amazon Cambridge uh, is a real focus on innovation. We're all working uh, right at the at the pioneering edge, or we like to think so anyway, of uh, the different uh, technological areas that we're involved in. Um, and so the, the first thing I wanted to, to talk about was uh, why diversity matters uh, in brief to us. It's a, it's a big topic, but in, a, you know, in summary, Amazon has hundreds of millions of customers around the globe, and they benefit from our diversity of thought uh, within our teams. So we see ourselves as a, a company of builders uh, and we bring varying backgrounds uh, and ideas and points of view into the design process, into the decision process. And that's key to enabling us to invent on behalf of that broad and diverse group of, uh, of customers. And those diverse perspectives come from lots of different sources. They <coughs> cover gender, ethnicity, national origin, educational background. We bring all these different uh, personal stories and life experience as well as our different professional experience to bear on these really complex and interesting problem spaces that we operate in. And so one of the challenges uh, for me and Lauren and the other leaders within Amazon Cambridge is how do, we, how do we develop leaders and shape teams that are built on that sort of that platform of diversity of thought and diversity of input so we can come up with the richest set of ideas uh, and invent and innovate on behalf of our customers. I think it'd be important to, to call out as well that while we believe that diversity and inclusion are obviously, they're good for business, if you like, in that way, uh, our commitment's based on something much more fundamental than that. And that is that it's, uh, it's simply right. Okay? It's just the right thing to do. And that's important for us uh, across Amazon and as leaders within Amazon. We've always been and will always be as a company committed to tolerance and diversity. Uh, and those are enduring principles for us, and they always will be. They're, they're reflected in our leadership principles and they're core to our culture. And I think sometimes when we talk about diversity, we kind of forget to just make that really important point. It's not just about saying, oh, well, we're better innovators, we're better builders if we have a diverse team. That's great. Uh, we also want a diverse team because we want to do the right thing, and that's important to all of us across the company at every single level. So what I wanted to touch on a little bit and maybe give you some specific examples is it's great to have uh, that strong commitment. It's great to have that desire to do the right thing. But what are the, what are the little steps, the small changes that build up to larger changes uh, and larger cultural shifts within the workforce? How do you actually make things happen uh, rather than just wanting things to happen? So I'll give you a few examples, share with you some of the things that we're doing in Cambridge and we'll continue to do more over the years to try and uh, improve the, the, the balance of diversity across our teams. We have a saying in Amazon that when it comes to making changes, good intentions don't work. And what we mean by that is really that when you're trying to change something within the business, then uh, quite often you already have the good intentions. Or I think in the case maybe of talking about diversity and inclusion, you and your team already think you have good intentions uh, at the very least. So you've got to think about how to change behavior and change working practices. Uh, those commitments are super important, they're a great starting point, but it takes an awful lot more than that to affect real change. So as a leader, these strong statements uh, of intention on diversity and inclusion are a great starting point, but they're not enough. And nor is a sort of simple 
self-confidence in my own ability to confront my biases as an individual. That doesn't get my organization to where I want it to get to. So one of the things that we've done within Amazon uh, Cambridge is we set up a diversity working group uh, that has representation in it from all the different teams across the campus. Uh, and it's an import important part of that group is that it has all the, all the makings of a team. So when we set up teams, when we set them up for success at Amazon, they have a mission, they have a set of tenets, uh, they have programs, they have projects that they execute, they have resource, that's how they deliver outcomes. Our working group is a team. It's built from across the different teams within Amazon Cambridge, but it has all of those pieces. Every meeting results in a list of actions. There are minutes that circulate. I think uh, it's not enough just to get together and, and talk. We have to have a real focus on what we can do. So uh, I'll <coughs> talk to you about some of the specific things we have done. One of the areas that the team looked at was gender, gender diversity amongst software engineers. How do we improve that? And, and if I talk to colleagues across <coughs> the wider industry, I think, I think two things that I hear a lot are, uh, firstly, people saying sort of something along the lines of, well, not that many women apply. And that's sort of coupled sometimes with, well, I'm not sexist, as though there's some sort of strange combination of that's the way the world is, plus a bit of sort of individual complacency is kind of good enough. And I think that it goes to what I was saying before about you know, it's not just about what's good for business, it's about doing what we believe in as, a, as an organisation. That, that sort of combination of complacency and that's how the world is, is the kind of, it's the 1970s bar. You know, it's, it's 2017, we can and should do so much better for, than that, and that, that involves us actually doing things differently. So once, you know, one example of a, a concrete thing that we did was we looked at why fewer women apply for our positions. We work with a, an external agency. We looked, for example, at uh, how we use language and how we describe our roles. We got some great advice on that. We rewrote a whole bunch of our job applications, uh, and we got a more diverse uh, pool of, uh, of candidates applying, um, and not just to actually across the axis of, of gender, but in, in many other ways as well. So one very specific example of the advice they gave us was that we'd uh, we tuned our job adverts very much around sort of search engine optimization. We put in every single sort of hard skill we could think of, every programming language, every database type and so on. And that ticks lots of boxes with search engines. But the advice we were given was that, that uh, research suggests that men are much more likely to apply for roles where the skills they have form a subset of the skills that you're looking for. And women are less likely to apply in that circumstance. So. Despite our, our sort of uh, heartfelt sense of good intentions, we actually we're writing job adverts that are actually discriminating against. Uh, you know, they're filtering out some of the people that we want to uh, we want to bring in. So having having that kind of insight, being able to reach out and get that kind of expert advice, not just relying on your own goodwill <coughs> or good judgment, I think is really important about. Uh, being able to then find real concrete changes and of course we've also got to follow that through so it's again one thing to think well yes we'll get around to that you've actually got to that's why having that working group those programs the projects the deadlines you've got to run that as a, a program of change as you would with anything else in the business we went and rewrote all of our adverts and that was a great thing and we've hired a whole bunch of people that I don't think we would have hired if we hadn't gone through that process so there's a there's a ton of things like that that we can continue to do and I think we can also reach a little bit further. We can really, that sort of, uh, that complacency about, well, why are fewer women applying? Well, I mean, you've heard from other speakers today, and I know there are other talks going on today, that there are huge imbalances in computer science that stretch right <coughs> the way back into school and university. So how can we as an organization, how can we deal with that? And again, there's, there's some things we can do directly. So for example, we fund uh, scholarships specifically for female engineers in London and uh, uh, Cambridge and Edinburgh, but also we can work with and partner with lots of organisations. There are organisations like RoboGirls, there are organisations like Career Ready that operate around Cambridge that's specifically interested in uh, addressing the imbalance in sixth form and university uh, across a lot of different um, uh, axes of diversity. So we can lend resource, we can lend mentors, uh, we can review code, we can provide equipment. There are tons of ways in which we can get involved. And going back to what I said at the start as well about, about it's not just about business, it's about who we are. It's a great thing for us to do for our organization. Every time I reach out to the organization and say, hey, we're gonna go and work with this organization or that organization, loads of people volunteer. Lots of people want to get involved. And I think uh, it's easy to forget sometimes uh, as a leader that you sort of, you 
Uh, it's easy to think that you and your leadership team are going to make all of the changes. But of course, with these uh, a sort of larger organization, then everybody can participate in making change. And the more we invite people in and we, we collaborate with experts and community groups outside of our organization, the more powerfully we can affect change. So, thank you. David, thank you very much. Time, but one question to David from the audience, a gentleman there. Hi, sir. My name is Mikhail, Mikhail Leo from CBRE Life Science. I've been doing, really, I've been doing some reading uh, in the last few months about the, the five top, you know, Facebook, Amazon, or Google, and Apple. And they seem to uh, have a tendency to give names like, you know, Amazonians, Googleans. And I know they've paid a lot of attention on their recruitment. Uh, around those uh, uh, those uh, fuzzy words, if you, if you may call it. So, so how do you define an Amazonian? And would, would an Amazonian fit within this diversity and innovation? That's a great question. So uh, I hope so. And if we found that that wasn't the case, then I, I trust that we'd work very hard to repair that. So I think being, you know, being an Amazonian, as I'm not sure I'm <laughs> quite as familiar with the language as you are, but I think... Uh, yeah. I think yeah, yeah, I think, I think uh, you know, for us, we have our leadership principles and they're a, they're a broad set. I think the important thing about our, well, two, two things to call out about the leadership principles. I think one is that uh, they infuse a lot of our discussion, that we don't just kind of wheel them out once a year for, you know, a town hall or something. They really do, they feed into uh, how we measure performance and how we measure success. And so they're getting them right and making sure that they do apply to uh, a diverse workforce is actually really fundamental to uh, being able to succeed as a company that's able to recruit and retain uh, and progress the careers of a diverse group of people. Uh, so we have a lot of them, they touch on a lot of different uh, aspects. I think one thing that's important is they're also their intention with each other. So for example we have uh, a leadership principle called bias for action which is about you know a bit of impatience to, to get things done. But we also have uh, leadership principles about building trustful and enduring relationships with stakeholders and partners, about getting deep into detail. Nobody is able to do all of those things uh, at the same time. And, and so they recognize those kind of trade-offs. And I think that's what makes the leadership principles work well with diverse teams, that div the team as a whole can be great at all of those, but no one person within the team is able to cover them all. You need a diverse team to cover all those bases. Lovely. I think we're thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Time. Yes, thank you.